When I was a kid, I was the prized object of a series of protracted custody battles, where in various different parts of my family were constantly manipulating my childhood innocence in order to weaponize me emotionally to get back at each other for various old grievances, both real and perceived. And this is my Freudian explanation as to why I love courtroom dramas and am generally fascinated by the legal system. Unfortunately, in my experience, most secondary worlds or one and a half secondary worlds always leave me asking one question. Where legal system? And this gets very irritating because I always see people building these vast and expansive sprawling complex systems of government, but there's always a gaping hole in a very crucial aspect of what a government system needs to do. And as a result, you have things like the chief of the magical police asking the prime minister for permission to do something? or just a parliamentary body that is elected but has absolutely no recourse at all against the government, yet somehow it still exists? Or, you know, the most obvious and egregious uh, absences of something, which is that there are no judges or barristers of any description mentioned anywhere in the law. Now, none of the things that I mentioned before are impossible, strictly speaking. They're just extremely implausible, especially if you understand why legal systems exist and how they work. So that that's what I'm going to try to explain to you in this video, so you're no longer terrified of even thinking about this weird thing with lawyers that you do not understand. Oh look, what is this? I've had this whiteboard for like seven years, I've just not had the time to hang it up until now. So fundamentally, a system of government is composed of three elements. A legislative, a judicial, and an executive. And these three represent different functions that need to be taken care of in order to have a functioning society. The legislative organ makes the rules. It comes up with the specifics of the wordings of the law and with the policies that should be implemented. The executive organ enforces the rules. So when someone is going to break the rules, they're the people who find out about it and who stop that from happening or punish the person if it has already happened, the intention of which is to ensure that other people do not do it. The judicial is the Freudian ego that remedies the fundamental issue that arises when the rubber of theory meets the road of praxis. Ambiguity. Something that I find a lot of writers get terribly, terribly wrong is that no corpus of law, no matter how intricate, could ever possibly cover every single possible scenario that might arise in the real world. Every law that exists can be interpreted in a million different ways, especially if you consider the fact that there are a lot of laws which are contradictory, because we live in a society that is composed of various contradictory and living in parallel interests. The purpose of the legal system is to resolve the conflict that arises when the rules clash with reality. For instance, it might be that the Crime Stoppers of the Executive want to go into someone's house to stop crimes that have been defined as illegal by the legislative. However, the legislative has also made a different rule that says you cannot go into someone's house because they have a right to privacy. Just because you're a government organ, you can't just go in there. Now, knowing of this contradiction, the legislative also says that you can go into people's houses if there is reasonable suspicion that they are committing a crime. But what constitutes a well-founded and reasonable suspicion because that's the letter of the law that is what the law says if you don't have that you can't go into someone's house and the legislative understands that it cannot make a universal catalog of specific rules that covers every single possible scenario especially in a world where the tactics of criminals and crime fighters 
are constantly adapting. I mean, you've played board games, right? The rules can never possibly cover every situation that might arise in play. And that is even though they represent the already artificially limited confines of the gaming board. So in order to resolve the ambiguity of this case and decide whether the executive should be allowed to go into your house to follow the rules of the legislative, in spite of the fact that the rules of the legislative say that they cannot do that, you ask a judge. The executive will ask the judge to get a search warrant for this particular house, thereby resolving the ambiguity that arises from the contradictory laws. I really hope that you now understand why it is so essential to have a legal system of some capacity within the government of your world. Anytime there are competing interests and the law isn't 100% clear on what is supposed to happen unless you want things to devolve into war, you need an adjudicating organ to decide what's what. But how does that work? exactly what it with all the with the lawyers shouting at each other from the wooden boxes what even is going on well there's a lot of different ways that something like this can happen but around the world and throughout time uh, most cultures have sort of gravitated toward the model i am about to describe plus minus a few elements usually you'll have an accusing party sometimes known as a plaintiff and an accused party sometimes known as a defendant and the plaintiff will accuse the defendant of having done something wrong for which the plaintiff is entitled to recompense. Usually this is breaking some sort of agreement between these two parties which is already against the law or specifically some law if this is a criminal case. In which case the executive would be the plaintiff. These will now go to a adjudicating body, which can be a judge, a panel of judges, with or without a jury. A panel of judges of three is the famous term tribunal. That's where that comes from, because it's three judges. It can really be anything, so long as it is a neutral adjudicating body, at least on paper. The plaintiff will try to convince the adjudicating body to make the defendant do something, whether it be keep to the contract, pay some sort of penance, or both. The defendant will attempt to convince the adjudicating body to not do this. In many cases, the two parties might come to an agreement without a decision from the adjudicating body, in which case this is called settling out of court. Now, the way most modern legal systems work, the adjudicating body will not punish the plaintiff if it turns out the plaintiff is wrong or if the plaintiff is being a dick, with, you know, exception of contempt of court, which is something that we don't need to be getting into. This is because we have other processes to decide these, like for instance, if the defendant felt feels like they were wrongfully accused of something and they had some sort of damages, they can then switch these roles and sue the plaintiff, this is called counter-litigation, or you have private arbitrage courts that focus on finding a mutually agreeable solution for these two parties. But, there is no reason why in your world building it should be impossible for the adjudicating body to primarily focus on that. This is just the way it works in most of our world. It doesn't have to work that way in your world. Now, both parties will be bringing forth arguments usually made by experts who know what kind of arguments can be made within the legal framework of the legislative, you may call them lawyers, and they will bring forth testimony through witnesses, which need not necessarily have witnessed the specific situation, especially when it comes to uh, criminal trials. Sometimes there's not even a specific situation to witness, but they can be experts who understand how these things work and can give a qualified opinion on what happened. Now, the defendant faces an additional difficulty in terms of not having witnessed something because you cannot prove that something didn't happen. The plaintiff may have witnesses that say that the thing happened, but you cannot prove a negative. You can only prove something that is mutually exclusive with the thing that is supposed to have happened. This precise disadvantage that the defendant has 
is why any fair legal system treats them as innocent until proven guilty. Especially in criminal cases, witnesses are often forensic experts and the like, who are capable of reviewing evidence with a professional eye. But there's also such a thing as character witnesses, who can actually make the argument in court that no, the defendant would never do such a thing, or yes, absolutely, this is exactly the kind of thing that the defendant would do. This usually constitutes circumstantial evidence, which is a scary term that you might have heard, but which is actually not all that complicated. This right here is footage of me eating a chocolate bar. It is direct evidence that I ate this chocolate bar. This, on the other hand, is footage of me next to the wrapper of the chocolate bar, where we know there was previously a chocolate bar. It is actually not direct evidence of me eating the chocolate bar, but it does point toward that having happened. Different courts have different standards of evidence that they require to convict a defendant. Usually, these are commensurate with the severity of the punishment that would follow such a conviction. If the punishment for eating that chocolate bar, for instance, was just me having to pay a fine of 20 bucks, I could just say, hey, support me on Patreon, and then I probably would be able to pay this fine. No big deal, life would go on for me. Therefore, the footage of me standing next to the chocolate bar, the circumstances substantial evidence might be enough to convict me. But if the punishment for eating the chocolate bar was, say, death, I'd be executed, life wouldn't go on, because I would be dead. And conceivably, there could have been someone else in the room with me. They had Sneak 100 and were crouching. How was I supposed to detect them in any way? Given the severity of the punishment, the circumstantial evidence would not be enough to eliminate all reasonable doubt that I did the thing. And therefore, I wouldn't be convicted and I would be innocent, or at least not guilty. Some court systems you can be innocent, other court systems you can be not guilty. Note that these kinds of rules are only in place in courts that actually give a shit about justice and human rights. If they're not, and you can just be convicted on circumstantial evidence, that is called a miscarriage of justice, when the legal system has done something that everyone agrees was a terrible decision. Even there, of course, there will be people who disagree with that. It might be a massive thing that, like, splits society. There is discourse over whether the decision was well-founded or not. Some people will call it a miscarriage of justice, other people will say that justice has been served. You can definitely point to examples of when this has happened. The opinions that can be had on this are basically limitless, but it is the judicial that actually has the authority to resolve this ambiguity. Miscarriages of justice often happen in sham trials or political trials that are not actually about the thing that happened, and the powers that be just want to have a veneer of legitimacy that happens when such a thing is decided by the sp supposedly impartial judicial. It is also often the consequence of systemic discrimination. A textbook example of this is the case of Walter Mc million who spent six years on death row and would have been executed for the murder of a young woman that he did not kill had not a capable defense attorney taken up his case. Basically, the only witness whose testimony was counted as valid and accepted by the court was that of a convicted felon who claimed that he had seen Walter McMillian do this crime. Meanwhile, there were like over a dozen people who placed him at a church social event several towns over during the time of the murder. So the thing that they witnessed is mutually exclusive with the thing that he was actually convicted over. The conviction was also overturned on the testimony of that same convicted felon when it turned out the police had intimidated him into giving that testimony. In case you hadn't guessed this already, the one convicted felon whose testimony was considered valuable was white, 
and the over a dozen law-abiding citizens whose testimony was dismissed or never even called into the courtroom were black. In many cases, if one of these parties is unhappy with the outcome of the trial, they can appeal the decision to a higher court, because courts, like most other bodies of government, are hierarchical in nature, and the people who sit on a higher court might have a different process, a different standard of evidence, a different legal opinion, or a different opinion on what actually happened. Theoretically, this is in place in order to avoid corruption, because judges that have risen higher in the ranks of the courts are supposed to have established themselves as more skilled in the interpretation of the law and more trustworthy as arbiters. Because remember, the judicial deals with ambiguity, and when it comes to the real world, there is a lot of ambiguity. But appeals can also sometimes lead to miscarriages of justice, even in favor of the defendant, as can be seen in the very high-profile case of John Demyanyuk, who was an American citizen who was deported to Israel because it turned out, oops, there was very strong evidence he was one of the guys who operated the gas chambers during the Holocaust. He was convicted of this initially, but his defense was then able to get this verdict overturned with the Israeli Supreme Court by calling into question the testimony of the witnesses specifically, thereby degrading the value of the evidence and introducing an amount of reasonable doubt that made it so he could not be convicted. So he walked free because in the opinion of the court, there was not enough direct evidence to say that he was that specific guy at that specific concentration camp who did these specific things, which was the verdict of the court that had been overturned. He was much later in a German court convicted of being a guy who operated gas chambers in concentration camps, just not this particular guy. Then unfortunately that decision was also appealed and then he died on appeal, in which case the legal system, because he could not stand trial on account of being dead, defaulted to him being not guilty. Naturally, cases like this generate a huge amount of outrage, but what needs to be understood for this is that most modern courts are highly procedure-oriented. They are extremely specific in what they pass judgment on, and it's very easy for people who are not experts on the law to misinterpret what the court said. Because remember, the court cannot make the rules. It is the legislative that makes the rules. I think this is the main grievance that a lot of people have with the concept of the legal system. They want to know who is right, who is wrong, and they want to know it now. They want to know who is going to definitely win the case. And the problem is that is the reason why there is a case. It's not entirely clear. Now, this whole thing about the executive, legislative, and judicial branches being very much separated from each other while at the same time having checks and balances on each other's power because we've learned that it's not actually an excellent idea to have any part of government be a lot more powerful than the others. That is a fairly new thing that hasn't been around for very long and it's not even the case all over the world. It's something we do in modern liberal democracies where we think it's important that people have rights and we do this to make sure that small groups of people can't trample on the rights of everyone else just because they're in power. Bad things have happened when that has been the case. And this is a very important function that high courts, especially constitutional courts, do a lot. They can't make laws of their own, but they can tell the government that the law that they just made is not actually valid. They cannot make that law, usually because it is incompatible with the Constitution. And of course, even between people of equal authority to interpret these things, there can be very different opinions on how they should be interpreted. Most famously, distinguishing between the letter of the law, aka uh, convicting or not convicting, based on an interpretation of how exactly the law is written, or the spirit of the law, aka convicting or not convicting, based on an interpretation of what the law in question actually means and why it was put into place. The most famous divide of legal scholarship is of course on the Supreme Court of the United States of America, where there is the concept of the living constitution, where the judge just say, okay, we have this constitution and what we need to do with it is we need to interpret it in a way that contextualizes to the modern times that we find ourselves in. And then there's another brand of thought, which is judicial originalism, which says, no, 
absolutely not. The Constitution was written in a certain specific time and needs to be interpreted in the context of that time. Both of these are equally valid legal opinions held by equally authoritative legal scholars in the country. But of course, the specifics of any given individual case are determined by the specifics of that given individual case. Not only does it depend on the circumstances, but also on the interpretations of the adjudicating body present. And for that, there is not an objectively correct way of interpreting the law. You have a thing where you have an AI judge to do it objectively, that doesn't exist. No such thing is possible. So even though courts do not make laws, what they say about laws has a massive impact on how laws are written and thought about. But to get away from the real world for a moment, for the purposes of your own world building, so long as the three bases of making the law, interpreting the law, and enforcing the law are covered by whatever your system of government, however informal or formal it might be, you are going to be able to distribute these over any number of institutions. And I do use institution and the law in a very loose sense here because people can can be informally institutions because society considers them such and the laws of a society don't need to be explicitly written down, they can just be social norms that are essentially created by social trendsetters. This isn't always the case, in fact, some might argue that historically it has rarely been the case, but there does need to be a reason that the decision of the court is respected. Or if it's not, that might also be a very interesting thing to happen. Very popular role for this is some sort of priest or medicine man, because through their role in society, they already represent some sort of higher authority that is beyond just the worldly. And through the fact that they represent this, if they make an unpopular decision, they are somewhat shielded from the consequences. The supernatural is very difficult to consult when it comes to the specifics of legislature, but when it comes to passing justice, it is handy in a pinch. If all else fails, there's always trial by combat, or sometimes trial by ordeal, which isn't specifically combat, but has you pass through some sort of horrible scenario and see if you come out the other end. And this also, in a way, is a religious institution institution because the idea is that the god or gods will guide the hand of the champion that is correct. You can mix and match these three up here however way you please. You might have an order of knights that makes the rules and also punishes people for not following them, but they need the approval of some sort of curia in order to do so. You might have one council that proposes legislation, and then another council that decides whether that legislation becomes law, but this is also a legislative chamber. This is a real thing that exists in the real world right now. Write down in the comments if you know what I'm referring to. You can have different kinds of legal systems with different kinds of judges for people, objects, and monsters, and the ones who pass judgment on monsters also get to execute that judgment because that's cool. You could even, and this is what most writers do, unite all three of these aspects in one guy. You could call him the Emperor, you could call him the King, you could call him John. Now a lot of you might be surprised to hear that historically this has been rather uncommon, at least in practice. Even totalitarian regimes have courts that they use to uh, settle disputes within a given ideology. And like medieval kings that were all powerful still had elected parliamentary bodies consisting of the clergy, the peasants, and the aristocracy, which were equally represented by one third each. At least that was a theory because in practice, and you could say that that was the system working as intended, the clergy and the aristocracy always had the majority by working together to fuck over the peasants. And obviously in terms of proportionality in society, the peasants were the largest group by far, but only had one third of the power in parliament. And the difference between how a system is supposed to work, and how it actually works, and how actually maybe the way it is supposed to work isn't how it is supposed to work, and the way that it actually works is how it is supposed to work, 
is an element that is very common in the real world, but one that I find extremely underutilized in most world building. In most dystopian settings, the reason the government is oppressive is because the government is designed to be oppressive and functions as it says in the theory of that government. Not because it's something that has a veneer of freedom, democracy, or whatever good values it pretends to embody that has been corrupted by a powerful elite. And this is the kind of place where courts fit in perfectly because they have the authority to make decisions about this kind of ambiguity and they can be massively important both to the schemes of the evil villains and to the good deeds of the good heroes. But even in medieval Europe, which let's be honest, a lot of the world building projects that you have are probably loosely based around, it wasn't the king who adjudicated between one farmer and a different farmer when one of them accused the other of having broken an agreement. That's something the local baron would have done because frankly, John is only one guy and there's only so many hours in the day where you can legislate, adjudicate and execute. When is he supposed to go fox hunting? And also, yes, just to confirm this, uh, the adjudication bit is why it's called the King's Court or rather the word court with the judges in him, that's where that comes from. Except, of course, when the local baron wouldn't make that decision because the king's court, wherever it might be located, might be a central place, like in some places in Europe, it might have been a wandering king, like in many other places in Europe, would send judges or justiciars, which are a sort of combination of, like, executive and judicial branch to do the job of passing judgment and adjudicating disputes. And speaking of medieval Europe, this is one of my biggest gripes when anybody says, oh yeah, this is a, a fantasy that's based on medieval Europe. Oh, do they use common law or civil law or customary law then, is always my question. And the answer to that question is always, what? Because there is a split in Europe, as you can see on this map of legal systems, and we will get into some of the others also because they're interesting, but there is a split where, as you can see, the overwhelming majority of Europe is and has historically, at least in principle, since the Renaissance been one color, and the thing that Americans mean when they say medieval Europe is a different color. So let's get into the blue one, which is what most of the world uses. It's called civil law, and it is really, really old conceptually. It started in the Mesopotamian Empire in the day of Hammurabi's Code, which is a book of law that is known as a civil code. And if you pass judgment as the king, you had to pass judgment based on this code. Now, to be fair, this was ancient Mesopotamia, where their equivalent of the Pope would beat the shit out of the king like once a year and then send them to get bussy at the trans moon priestess temple, which is somehow a lot less gay than the Catholic Church appointing a Holy Roman Empire a thousand years after the Roman Empire was no longer a fucking thing even. Just because some guy who died before the Roman Empire was actually a thing had a dream about a statue once. The point is, the thing that is valid for passing judgment is the civil code. Whatever the code of the land is, whether it's Hammurabi's code, the Germanic legal code, the Roman code, the Napoleonic code, a lot of different codes, they are what matters. Laws written in the code are intended to be broadly applicable and judges are supposed to pass judgment in compliance and based on these rules by whoever authoritative body, usually this one, made them up. And then there's what the English did. Basically, there were a bunch of judges who were traveling the country imbued with authority by the king's court in order to pass judgment on disputes that were happening all over the place. And to do this, they would assemble a jury of local people and ask them what the local traditions were in order to based on that, then pass judgment on this disagreement. The idea was that the jury, being locals, knew the traditions of the place better and also all of the people involved, so they could also essentially act as character witnesses or direct witnesses. Then, based on the deliberations of the jury, the judge would pass judgment in the name 
of the king, which created a very interesting situation where you basically had a sort of democratic legislative that was part of the judicial process. But then back in London, the judges would be sort of hanging out and realize that they had passed very different judgments based on very similar situations because of different deliberations of the jury based on varying local customs. This is when the precedent of previous judgments passed by different previous judges in similar situations situations became a very important canonical body in deciding what kind of judgment would be passed. And the idea was that these were sort of derived from all the local customs, but, you know, it's, it's except adjudicated by it, judges who knew what they were doing, so often they would get rid of juries entirely, sort of disregarding the whole point of respecting the local customs and traditions, which then was no longer happening. In 1154, tired of all this inconsistency, King Henry II decided to create a sort of civil code, but don't call it that, based on these precedents and local traditions that then would be referred to as common law. And one of the key aspects of common law was that juries were very firmly, importantly, part of the law, but so were precedents. So he decided which of the laws that the local communities came up with to include and put into praxis while at the same time also putting in some of the laws based on the precedents that his judges had decided and making this a sort of formally informal kind of law. Look, common law is very complicated. It, it's, so, it's such a fucking quagmire of like just horrible shit. Don't it's uh. what I mean to say by all this is that all of this is social constructs. It's all made up and in essence, you can do whatever you want if you are ready to be insulted by terminally online law students about it. These days, the key difference between common law and civil law legal systems is that common law has juries, except when it doesn't, and also except where civil law, which usually doesn't have juries, does. And while precedent is almost religious scripture in common law, in civil law it is used as an argument, but just because there is a precedent that would apply here, that doesn't mean that the judge has to rule the same way at all, because the only thing that counts is the civil code. You will have noticed that a civil law and common law are not at all mutually exclusive in any way. They are actually very compatible. Many mixed forms of these systems exist, and of course common law places have legislative bodies that make laws that are important and taken into account in these judgments. In fact, this is not a contradiction at all. They are very essential in that whole process, but I'm not gonna go into the reasons for that here because it's frankly not relevant. And there's different subcategories for all these systems too, right? Like, for example, a civil law has Napoleonic law, where one of the crucial differences, uh, among many others, is that your defense attorney is not necessarily supposed to defend you no matter what, even if you are the guiltiest motherfucker that's ever lived, but that they are supposed to argue your position in your case in the process of working together with the prosecution to find out the truth as to whether or not you are guilty. And to even further demonstrate just how non-exclusive these categories are, Quebec and Louisiana have hybrid form legal systems between common law and civil law, but it's specifically Napoleonic civil law. And did I mention that this is kind of separate but also the same from criminal law where things work like this except when they don't? Once again, not something we're going to get into because it's not super relevant. This is not a, a, an attempt at explaining the legal system to you. It's an attempt at helping you build your own fictional legal system. If you use the exact same procedures unless you're doing a specific historical setting, which in which case you wouldn't be doing world building, you don't have to worry about it. Instead, let's look at some other types of legal systems that exist or have existed throughout the world. Customary law is something that is still important and relevant to the civil law of Scandinavia today, and it's sort of a, a cousin and also grandfather of common law that took a different path in life. Basically, what is the law and how it is to be interpreted is based on tradition, how it was always done, all things that everyone sort of universally agrees upon, like for instance, Murder is bad! Very often customary law also has sort of reference documents that are not the same thing as a civil code. Uh, they are the protocols of get-togethers that are sometimes called diets, 
recesses or things where people who are essentially legislative lawmakers get together and record traditions, talk about various different judgments that have happened and establish the social norms to be written down. You might say that customary law is the law of what feels right, but if you did actually say that unironically, people would be angry with you. This is considered a bit antiquated and is often only used in conjunction with other systems because disagreement of what is and what is not custom, they have different opinions on it. A more modern and functional way of doing customary law is actually common in many current African tribal societies where disagreements about what the customs are, are resolved by another type of judicial body. Customary law was the standard in Europe before common law became established in England and before the University of Bologna, which is the oldest still continuing to operate university in the world, was established in order to interpret the ideas of the Roman legal code, which is how the idea of civil law and a civil code were reintroduced into continental Europe. And then, of course, we also have religious law, which I know a lot of you have been waiting for. In medieval Europe specifically, you had ecclesiastical courts run by the church, most famously the Inquisition, because baked into the Christian ideology is a fundamental separation between matters mundane and matters supernatural in terms of governance. And for the matters supernatural, the church had to have its own legal systems to make judicial calls in, in place. And in spite of their reputation, most ecclesiastical inquisition courts were not actually like bloodthirsty kangaroo court type situations that were just out to destroy lives. They were actually, even in the context of modern times, often very fair and objective tribunals. Or, you know, at least as fair and objective as you can be when you pass judgment on whether or not to punish people about things that are objectively not real. And when it comes to all the historical witch hunts that the a church is very famous for. It turns out most of them were actually decided in mundane courts outside of the ecclesiastical authority of the Catholic Church and very often not even specifically by Catholics at all, but by churches that were not Catholic and don't recognize the authority of the Vatican. Especially during the medieval period, inquisitors would be bewildered at the stories of some of the trials by ordeal that were used to determine whether or not someone was a witch, which wasn't even the primary purpose of inquisition. I'm sorry, so let me get this straight, right? You drowned a girl to see whether or not she was a witch, and she would have been a witch if she had survived the drowning. What the fuck? You might not expect this, but the Spanish Inquisition was actually extremely lenient and had a less than 3% conviction rate. And it was also, as I hinted at earlier, established primarily to find heretics among the formerly Jewish and Muslim populations of converts in Spain. Because, and this is true, there were no witch hunts in the medieval period. That shit didn't happen then. It was all in the modern period, at least all of the major ones. You might find some obscure historical examples. They were very much not the norm. And yes, I am aware that the Spanish Inquisition also was during the modern period. This is an unrelated fact. As a matter of fact, during the medieval period, the general opinion of the body politic among European royalty was that witches didn't exist. They weren't real, they were superstitions. Now as time went on, what happened more and more was that kings and bishops both were of the opinion that they had jurisdiction with their courts over a particular thing that had happened. This was a situation where there was ambiguity, but the ambiguity existed between different systems that passed judgment, and there was no higher system of passing judgment to decide the ambiguity of who would get to decide the ambiguity, whether it would be the, the worldly courts or the ecclesiastical courts. Now, a place where such conflicts were rather rare has always been the Islamic world, because Islam does not have the whole render unto Caesar thing. They do not have a separation between mundane and ecclesiastical matters when it comes to 
passing judgment and making laws. Islam includes, not just in the expanded universe, a full and functional system of government, which is something that differentiates it from Christianity. Now, the Pope was obviously, in real terms, very, very influential politically during the medieval period. Like, for instance, the Pope would crown the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. That is what gave the Emperor legitimacy. And also, you know, the Vatican had the ability to administer the Papal States, which existed as distinct geographical regions. But the clergy and the Pope were still somewhat outside of the aristocratic social order of the Emperor. There was this distinction. In Islam, this isn't so. The Caliph is Pope and King and Emperor and the religious scripture all of the different texts, because the Quran is not the only sacred text in Islam, includes very detailed instructions on how to build a state, which laws to follow, and how to pass out which punishments. So essentially we have a sort of civil code legislated through divine authority, but the people who would obviously adjudicate this code, because once again it cannot be perfect for every single situation, are various different religious scholars and also important executive authorities authorities that would enforce the will of this judicial. But obviously, because of, once again, the ambiguity that arises, there is a lot of disagreements between various different religious scholars, which, when backed up by the force of various different executive powers, can lead to some rather nasty schisms. But wait, it gets even more complicated. Not all places where Islamic law applies has Islamic law apply to the same extent and to the same things. In some places, there is a certain differentiation between these two things, especially in modern times. Even in Islamic theocracies, which are not necessarily always run by a caliph, there are sometimes secular or semi-secular courts that engage in customary law or civil law type procedures. This is uh, for specific areas of the law where certain scholars have decided that the holy scriptures do not have enough of a framework to justify having a functional legal system. Although, of course, they would never put it this way. And of course, the most important thing is that none of this matters if the executive refuses to enforce the judgments that you pass. That is why throughout time, many of the most successful civilizations, to use a very broad term, have had checks and balances in place. So these three aspects of governments in whatever way that they were arranged could not become too powerful individually until, of course, inevitably things changed and that happened. And while factionalism over the interpretations of certain laws and legal texts and precedents and so on and so forth can be vicious within the judicial, you should know that they can be even worse within the other two branches of government because they don't have the authority to enforce the opinions that they have but they still have those opinions and their opinions are not necessarily subject to just the proceedings of the law but their own political goals which the judicial is not supposed to have now i just dumped a whole lot of information on you much of which was contradictory, and I did that on purpose. You may have come to this video thinking that I would explain to you how you can world build your legal systems, and now that you've seen it, you're more scared of that prospect than you were before. But the real fact of the matter is that within the chaos of all these various different contradictions, you can basically do what you want so long as you understand the principle of the three areas that need to be covered. Because even throughout time, most systems and even legal systems have been dysfunctional. Really the only mistake that you can make with legal systems when world building is to not have one. They are an essential part of a functioning society and even a lot of non-functioning societies. And they're an excellent tool to create and illustrate conflict in your world. If you have a world where the system is clean and just sort of works, not only is that completely implausible, it will not maintain the suspension of disbelief that you need, but you're also missing out 
on a huge thing that you want to be doing when you are world building, which is creating points of conflict out of which you can weave stories. And I think it's a damn shame that legal systems do not play a bigger role in that. Thank you very much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar, buying some of my merchandise or my short story collection. And in that spirit, this was kind of a long one. I tried out a couple new cool things, like using the whiteboard that's over there, in, in case you cared where the relative positioning is for that. Over there is a window. And see you around, cunts.